Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, sponsored by Loserpool. I'm your host, Harry Simeon, and on this week's show, we'll be looking back at the weekend's draw with Wolves. First of all, I'm going to give my views on it, and then, of course, I'll be joined, as usual, by some very special guests, so do stay tuned for that. Don't forget, we are now recording video podcasts, so you can also find us on YouTube, and you can see my lovely face while I rant and rave about my beloved Arsenal um, but of course, the, the shows still are on iTunes, on, on SoundCloud, on Acast, on Podbean, on FNX Network and all the usual places. Uh, so do not fear if you are one for the audio, that's absolutely fine. Nothing changing on that front. Right. So Arsenal won, Wolverhampton Wanderers won. Not ideal in the end, um, given that Spurs won at Palace and that Chelsea dropped two points at home, meaning we missed the opportunity to close the gap on them down to just two points. So first of all, let's take a look at some of the match facts. Uh, in terms of possession, Arsenal 72% to Wolves is 28%. Arsenal had 10 shots to Wolves is 13. We had three on target, Wolves with five on target. We dominated in terms of corners, 11 to 2. Um, and Wolves committed almost double the amount of fouls that we did. But I guess that's expected from the away side and, and particularly when they're leading the game. I think what Sunday proves is that possession means nothing if you don't make it count. And in terms of ideas, we certainly didn't have any on Sunday. Uh, Pre-match, I'd predicted a 1-1 draw um, on my Twitter feed and, of course, on the preview show right here on the Chronicles of Aguna. On the basis that I feel Arsenal haven't been playing that well of late, um, and Wolves have impressed me so far this season. And I felt that Nuno Espirito Santo's tactics would certainly cause us problems. That proved to be the case. When I say Arsenal haven't been playing well, this is something that stretches back quite a while now. If you look at the game against Blackpool, we were crap. If you look at the game against Crystal Palace, I thought we were crap there. If you look at the game um, against Sporting the other night, I thought we were shit against them. If you look at the game against Liverpool... I'm not saying that we were terrible that day, but I don't think we were as good as everybody's made out. Um, that's, that's just my opinion. I don't think we deserve to win that game. I thought Liverpool had the better chances. I've spoken about this already, so I don't want to repeat myself. But, you know, th this sort of result has been in the pipeline for a while now. It's been coming. So I wasn't surprised and hence why I made that prediction in the first place. In terms of Wolves, um, I felt that, you know, one of the, potential areas on the pitch that we could dominate would be in the center of the park because I felt that Neves and Moutinho whilst they're great footballers may not dig in deep enough and may not battle hard enough for their manager and, and as a result I, I hoped that Granit Xhaka and Lucas Torreira could get a real foothold on the game and, and really pull the strings um, I was proved wrong in terms of their ability to battle and work for the team because both of them were absolutely brilliant both of them got stuck in, um, but also showed quality on the ball and picked out great passes and, and ultimately created some brilliant chances for Wolves. Now, from an Arsenal point of view, said Kolasinac at left back, it's probably safe to say that not for the first time um, recently, he had a poor game. He has shown that Whilst he can probably get forward pretty well, probably as well as Nacho Monreal, in my opinion, in terms of his power, his dribbling ability, I think he's got a good delivery on him when he gets into the right positions. I think what we have seen is that he's nowhere near as defensively conscious. And I know that Unai Emery asks his fullbacks to bomb up and down and provide support for the attack. But there's got to be a balance there. And, and whilst the manager can instruct, there's got to be... Uh, a level of responsibility taken by the player. I don't feel that Seja Kolasinac um, thinks about defending enough. I think he's casual at times. I think he plays silly passes in dangerous areas. Um, one in particular that he played inside to Granit Xhaka. He's taken some stick for that. Granit Xhaka decided to dummy the ball. Not entirely sure what he was trying to do there. And it ended up uh, resulting in a Wolves goal. So whilst I don't blame Kolasinac solely for that, I just think, you know, this. There's room in front of you. There are options ahead of you 
why have you opted to, to give that to Granite Xhaka? Um, again, emphasize the point that it's probably Granite Xhaka's fault. It is Granite Xhaka's fault, in fact. Um, but I just felt that some of Kalasinac's passing was a little casual and, and it often puts us into trouble. I also don't think that he's good enough at getting back. Um, and as a result, Rob Holding was being pulled out to that left uh, to our left hand side time and time again and isolated by Helder Costa way too often. Um, and he's a player who's got bundles of pace, bundles of talent, a great deal of skill. And, and he proved, you know, a real threat uh, until he was taken off in the second half. Now, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang um, won the Player of the Month award, actually. So it seems silly that I'm sitting here criticising him. But for me, as a centre forward, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang just doesn't do enough. The, the movement is not there. You know, people were saying at half time, uh, sort of friends in the ground around me, you know, it's not his fault because he's playing out on the left. He's isolated. That's not his position. And I completely get that argument. I do. But then when he's moved into the centre to play alongside Lacazette as he was in the second half, there's no excuse anymore because that is his preferred position. That is where Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang wants to play. That's where Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang has made his name. So if he can't perform there, then you've got to ask questions. One of the things that was really frustrating for me watching from the outside was the fact that I would look at our attack at times and, you know, at halftime we turned into this 4-3-1-2 sort of thing with Ozil off of Lacazette and Aubameyang and we we didn't have much width um, in term, on the left-hand side particularly. I thought Kanashin actually tired a little bit and, and certainly wasn't uh, getting up and down and, you know, that's why Emery eventually took him off and, and made the changes that he did. But... I would have liked to have seen Aubameyang pulling the centre-back out of position a little bit. I know Wolves had three centre-backs and for the first half, having just Lacazette up top meant we were only occupying one of them. And so the other two had an easy ride and, and hence why they were able to defend so effectively. But what I'm saying here is I would like to see Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, you know, look at his his opponent and say, do you know what? I'm not actually getting any joy here at the moment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull you wide. I'm going to pull you into the area of the fullback with my runs. That's an area that you don't want to go into. Then comes the grey area, the confusion between the centre half and the right back. Who takes him on? Do I pass him on? Do I follow my man? And ultimately, you're you're causing mix up, mix ups galore, sorry, in the Wolves' defence. And, and you, that's where gaps start to form. Then, you know, your your Ozils, your Ramses, your Mikitarians, whoever the attacking midfield players may be, can make those late bursts um, into the spaces vacated. And, and, and I want to see more movement from Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. There was none of that yesterday. None at all. None whatsoever. And, you know, yes, he scores goals. But yesterday, um, he missed a fantastic chance. Uh, the one that came off the post. I thought that was unlucky. I don't want to be overly harsh on that. But... I just want to see more from him in terms of movement, in terms of pulling people out of position, in terms of creating space for his uh, his teammates. And a perfect example of a striker doing that without actually scoring was Raul Jimenez on the other side. You know, he's on loan from Benfica. I spoke about him in the preview show that he reminds me a bit of Olivier Giroud, except he's more mobile in the sense that, yes, he might not score uh, a great deal of goals but what he does is he pulls people away he creates space for people he holds the ball up and all the other elements that you need for a center forward he has them yeah he could probably score a few more goals and I'm sure Wolves fans would absolutely love it if he found a way of doing that but the point I'm making here is that a center forward's movement can create opportunities for his teammates and with Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang that is not happening now, a player who I will heap praise on is uh, Bernd Leno. What a fantastic performance from the German goalkeeper. In in many ways, you know, he was our saviour yesterday because I honestly believe that had Bernd Leno not been on the pitch yesterday, we would have lost. We would have got beat and we'd have deserved to get beat as well. Um, he made two great saves in the first half. Uh, one where Helder Costa managed to wriggle through a one-on-one -on -one opportunity and he also made a good save diving down to his right again from Helder Costa. Um, there was the uh, one-on-one -on -one in the second half 
where Raul Jimenez put the ball across to the far post. I think it might have been Moutinho that was coming in. And again, you know, he arrived, uh, Bern Leno, quickly on the scene, made himself big. Another fantastic block. And then there was the other one from Adama Traore. I mean, how many crucial saves can a goalkeeper make? You know, he was unbelievable yesterday. I thought he'd done everything right. Um, without doubt, Arsenal's best player. And, and certainly he's proving people uh, wrong who doubted him uh, initially. I think he's proving that he, he probably does deserve to be Arsenal's number one. And Petr Cech's going to have a difficult time displacing him now based on what we saw yesterday and and of course over the last few weeks you know um bar maybe the Liverpool game where I thought there were a few mistakes there uh, he's, he's been really impressive hasn't he um Unai Emery again wasn't afraid to make some substitutions and and that's something he's been praised for of late his boldness um when uh, acting from the bench the decision to remove Mesut Ozil for me was a strange one and one that I don't particularly agree with. Now, I know Ozil didn't have his greatest game. Um, and that can be said pretty often, probably too often. Um, and, and that's the problem, I guess. But what I will say is Mesa Ozil is capable of unlocking a defence with one moment, one pass, one uh, one ounce of brilliance. And he, he can get you going. And I felt we missed his quality when he went off in the sense that um, often on the left-hand side, Gwenduzi was picking up the ball um, and I just think, you know, I'd much rather that was Mesut Ozil in that position, looking to engineer something and create something. Mikitarian was out there quite a bit as well. Um, and I know his cross, I don't want to call it a shot because it wasn't, it was a cross, ended up in the back of the net, but that was more by luck than judgment. Um, so, you know, I just felt that taking Mesut Ozil off was, was, wasn't the right thing. Um, I don't know what you think on that. Let me know. Tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC. Um, going back to Emery's and his changes, I didn't think the formation change really paid off, to be honest. Um, I see what he was trying to do. He tried to push Mesut Ozil on uh, to play behind the two strikers, as I've already mentioned, and then have that midfield trio of, of Xhaka, Torreira and Guendouzi. Um, for me, that made us a little too narrow. Um, and, and when a team play five at the back because make no mistake it might have been described by commentators and pundits and stuff that uh wolves were playing with a back three but they were certainly playing with a back five when we had the ball make no mistake about that um i think we had real problems dealing with helder costa um i thought he was probably wolves best outfield player on the day uh, that best player full stop actually to be fair Rui patricio didn't do much did he um, I think apart from that Lucas Torreira save, you or I could have probably played in goal for Wolves yesterday and got away with it. So, um, yeah, Helder Costa was fantastic and he often isolated Rob Holding. Um, that's potentially a flaw in our system where the fullbacks bomb forward and Holding's forced to go across. Um, he just didn't have the pace to cope with him. The guy was too tricky, too fast, too skillful um, and too alert. And, and that caused him Holding some real problems. And, and that lack of pace was further exposed by Adama Traore when he came on. And I've always said this about that player. If he had brains, if he had skill, um, you know, he would be unbelievable. But he's just not a very sophisticated footballer. Um, and in my opinion, you know, it, it's a shame because he's got the physical attributes um, and the pace that I don't think anyone can cope with, if I'm being honest. Look, I think in conclusion... We were lucky not to get beat, extremely lucky, in fact, because Wolves were by far the better team on the day, I thought. They'd done everything right. They executed their instructions perfectly. And despite what Nuno Espirito Santo said after the game where he spoke about how he wasn't disappointed with a point because a point away at Arsenal is a great result and you know they've just come up from the championship and so on and so forth, I think deep down inside he'll be gutted. He'll be devastated that Wolves didn't win that because they, they certainly deserved it. Um... I think what these past few weeks have shown is they've shown us in a truer light. They've shown fans where we actually are in terms of our progression. I think some of us deep down knew that that run of results we were on wasn't uh, reflected in our performances. I don't think our performances have been as great as the results would suggest. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, so, you know, we're still a work in progress. Unai Emery needs time. He needs time. A lot of those players are not his players um, and, and probably aren't fully capable of playing the way in which he wants to play. 
So I think you need to give him another two, three transfer windows and hope that the club back him and, and see where we go from there. I think the international breaks come at a good time for Arsenal because I think we've been struggling of late. Um, we've looked jaded, we've looked tired um, and, and we've not been in our full flow. So let's hope that the international break gives those players some time to get away, um, refresh and, and for the manager as well to take a break and, and rethink things and, and go again, you know, uh, come uh, a couple of weeks time. I think we shouldn't overreact though at the same time. Um, you know, if you told me that at this point we'd be where we are and on this unbeaten run and, and so close to the top four, I'd have taken it. So I'm not knocking it. Um, I'm not knocking where we are. I think in terms of our league position and our points tally, we're probably about where we thought we would be, maybe a bit better um, in a lot of people's eyes. So yeah, no need for overreaction. Let's see how it goes. Um, and hopefully we can recuperate over the international break and come back stronger. Right, I'm going to take a short break now. And when I return, uh, I'll be joined by some guests. So stay tuned. Enjoying what you've heard so far? If so, make sure you hit that subscribe button and leave us a review on iTunes. Joining me on the line to give us his reaction to the game between Arsenal and Wolverhampton Wanderers is Mike Stavrou. Mike, welcome back to the Chronicles. How are you, sir? How was your weekend? Yeah, not bad, Harry. Not bad, apart from that. It was, but it was a great weekend of sport. So, you know, I even watched some rugby, which is unlike me, but it was actually quite good. Rugby, uh, because really? obviously mm. I work for Love Sport, I've got to cover a range of sports, so we did a bit of rugby, looked at some cricket, but you know, the football on Sunday was great, apart from our game. So, <laughs> What did you make of it, Mike? What went wrong from an Arsenal perspective? Um, you know, I've had my say already, I feel as though maybe people are getting a little bit caught up in Arsenal's faults and not giving Wolves the praise that they deserve. How did you see it? Um, it's a difficult one, Harry, because I don't think we played up to... Our, uh, our level that we've been recently and it's that same old thing that we've mentioned so many times the first half form and I saw some stats from a friend of the show James Benj actually today and he said that in the first halves of the Premier League Arsenal have scored only nine out of their 26 goals for but also conceded nine of their 15 goals against and we've not led at half time in any game in the Premier League that's not good enough and um, it just so happens that we got punished because Wolves were really good in the first half. And we can't continue to play at this intensity in the first half. We need to start fast and set the tone for the entire game. And yeah, I just think that we weren't at the races at all, Harry, and Wolves punished us. And we should have lost, really, for me, to be honest. Yeah, I totally agree. And had Bern Leno not been in goal, you know, we could have easily conceded four or five. Um, yeah, for sure. Again, similar to the Liverpool game, Wolves had the better chances. I've got to say that. Um you know, a lot of people have been picking on certain individual players again. Seems to be a I common wonder. theme amongst Arsenal fans. Um, <laughs> go on, have your say. I know you're dying to do it. I know you're you're really yeah. You know what? A bit. You know what, Harry? I'm not one of these fans that will constantly bash it in for a player that I've got an agenda against. There's no agenda, but what I see, I have to say, and Granite Xhaka again. You know, it's just mindless, and he has these moments where all thought goes out the window and I don't know what happens, if it's a brain freeze or what, but yeah, just, I, I, I don't know what he was doing, what he was thinking. There was clearly no one around. It's his awareness, I think, but putting more stats out of the bag. Here um, we go. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's five errors um, directly leading to goals uh, since he made his debut in August 2016. No other outfield player in the competition, which means in the Premier League, has made more in that period of time. And, you know, I did say recently that he might have turned a corner, but things like this make me think, actually, maybe not, Harry. OK, here's, here's a question to you, Mike. Um, I, I completely get where you're coming from. Granit Xhaka has stupidly attempted to dummy the ball there. I don't know what he's, what he's trying to do. Um, so, yeah, I get it. He's at full point the finger by all means. However... Looking at the overall 90 minutes, was Granit Xhaka any worse than Rob Holding, than Sead Kalasinac, than Mesut Ozil, than Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang? No, no. I mean, no. I have to answer honestly. But what he did do was a costly error and that, that cost us. There were moments, you're right, where Rob Holding um, 
lost his marker or he made a stupid challenge that could have cost us. It didn't. But I think overall the point is that we were terrible. But I don't understand some of the reaction on social media, Harry. I think our fans are so reactive and we have to look at it in the context. We're still on a 15-match unbeaten run, right? Absolutely. We've beaten some, some decent teams. We've just drawn... Yes, we're still doing well. And I think people have to take that into perspective and just look at, you know, the progress we've made under an Emery. And, you know, not every match is going to be perfect. We're not always going to be good. But I think what Emery has to do now is really hone down on why we're starting so slow and try and fix that. Whether it's attitude, whether it's, you know, him conserving us, I, I don't know. But he needs to really, really address it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a common problem, isn't it? It's been happening for so long now. We can't keep avoiding it. We can't keep sweeping it under the rug. I think some of our fans have overreacted. I completely get where you're coming from. Um, it sounds silly, but for me, what this does do is it paints a clearer picture of where Arsenal are actually at. Because, as I said in my previous segment on here, that I felt that you know the, the run we're on, the performances haven't really justified that. So, you know, we, we're overachieving, in my opinion, so far, because I think our performances haven't been great. Um, I think going back to your point regarding, you know, you said that Holding made some mistakes and so on, and but he didn't get punished for them. But that's not down to anything other than luck. The fact that he didn't get punished for him, the fact that Bern Leno's dug him out of a hole two, three times yesterday, that is not because Holding is any better than Granite Xhaka. That's just pure luck. And so people need to take that into account as well, you know, Often, when you make a stupid mistake, you will get punished. If you don't get punished, then you've got to look up to the heavens and say thank you because you've got away with it. It's not because your mistake was less bad than anybody else's. And this is my thing, you know, the, the agendas start again around certain players. You know, for me, taking Mesut Ozil off was a mistake. Um, I, I said that in my segment. I felt that he is always capable of, of providing that one killer pass that one magical moment that can open a team up. And I thought we had no idea when he went off the pitch. The formation was a mess. When Doozy was practically playing on the left wing, it was just an absolute mess. Aubameyang was playing up front with Lacazette, except Aubameyang wasn't interested in the game whatsoever. You know, there's so many. there were so many problems yesterday. And like you said, shouldn't overreact because it's a one-off game. However... It, it does show, doesn't it? It does prove that actually we're not as far down the progression line as maybe some people think. Yeah, I mean, you're totally right. It was kind of papering over cracks a bit, wasn't it, with some of the performances? Because especially of late, because there was that draw against the Liverpool where we played well. But then also there's been sporting where we weren't good. There was Palace again where we weren't good. And there was games where we kind of dug ourselves out a bit with a really good second half performance, but poor first perform first half performance. And... Yeah, I mean, we really do have to take it as it comes. And um, one thing I will say is that this next month or so will define us because we've got Bournemouth next after the international break away. They're in brilliant form. Um, and then we've got Spurs at home. And I think for the fans, that is the kind of be all and end all for us. If we win that, you know, it's kind of, it's a blaze of glory. But if we don't, it might all go shambolic again. And just touch on the fans again, how it really does annoy me because I've got to shout out Arsenal Fan TV here because they are so toxic in terms of the kind of views that they portray. And then that kind of view gets extrapolated to all of us. Like there was a guy on, on there yesterday saying, well, you know, if this carries on, it's no better than under Wenger. I'm sorry, but take it into, into the context a bit, all right? As I said, 15 match run, beat and run. Yeah, we haven't played well. But would we have gone anywhere near this run with Wenger? I don't think so. So people just need to, need to step back and, you know, work it out what's actually happening and not be so emotional for me. Yeah. I think that, that that's the danger, though, isn't it? With doing um, interviews and, and talking to people immediately after the game or during a game. Because we all say things yeah. during a game that we don't mean. Um, I'm guilty yeah. of doing that. And hence why I always record these podcasts on the Monday. Um, for release on the Tuesday because I feel it gives me time to reflect on the game and put a fair opinion across as opposed to being reactive and angry and, and, and spouting off silly things. And yeah, you're right. It does happen a lot. It, it, it's it's an issue. Um, I think that unfortunately some of our supporters are not smart enough to understand that it is a reactionary thought 
or a reactionary you know interview and and yeah you're right it does it does prov- it does make things toxic a little bit I totally agree can't disagree with that yeah just touching on Ozil Harry I think he had one of them games didn't he where he looks kind of lost he was coming so deep to pick up the ball and it's not good like when he's in line with Xhaka and Torreira or when he's even dropping deeper than them nothing's going to happen but that was mostly because there was no movement like Bamiyang was still again I thought he's he I think he's wasted on the left especially if we're not in an open game if we're against a team that's sitting behind the ball he's pretty much useless to be honest with you unless we're putting loads of crosses in the box from the the right hand side with Bellerin and he's popping up at the far post he really doesn't affect the game at all and I think it's an issue that we do need to sort out I still don't think Emery knows what formation his best plays he's going with and you're right when when um when doozy came on what on earth was that formation I, i've looked i've looked i've watched it a couple of times i still don't know i texted my mates so i was like like what the hell is going on it's a mess yeah your guess is as good as mine i, I try i tried to make it out as a four three one two but then gwen doozy came on ozil came off and then i don't know what the hell was going on after that because it was just a mess and I don't like as much as Matteo Guendouzi is impressed. I don't want to be relying on him because he is a kid, and I don't want to see him on the left flank. And that's what we saw for the most part of the second half yesterday. He had to cut inside every single time. His delivery yeah. was poor, and and this is no criticism of him, but that is not his position, you know. And I don't know, man. I I maybe wouldn't have taken Iwobi off because at least. He was driving at Wolves when he picked up the ball, maybe not to good effect at that point. However, he has that ability to dribble, something that we don't have in other players at the moment. And for me, again, I I keep going back to it, but taking off Mesut Ozil took off the one player we have capable of unlocking a stubborn defence like that. And, you know, Aaron Ramsey for me is is a passenger now. Um, It looks like he doesn't want to play for Arsenal anymore. I get it, he's leaving. But, you know, bringing him on every week as, for this sort of cameo role. Yeah, is... he had a good chance yesterday, to be fair, though. Yeah. Which he, he could have married. Yeah, absolutely. He did. Um, I thought that our fullbacks, uh, whilst they did try and get forward like always, I thought they were just completely pushed back by Wolves' fullbacks. And, and, you know, make no mistake, the graphics will tell you Wolves played with a back three. They played with a back five. They played with a back yeah. five and they made back it Back seven, different. eight at that point, sorry. Yeah. They were so defensive. Absolutely. But um, yeah, you're, I, I think Kolasinac had a poor game. He's ripped to shreds by Helder Costa. He absolutely had him on toast. You know, every time he got the ball, Kolasinac looked scared. I think we do miss Nacho Ma- Monreal. Maybe not as good going forward, but I think defensively he's a lot more solid. One thing I want to ask you, Harry, you, you mentioned there that we've got no players in wide positions that can pick up the ball and drive at people. Yep. So when does it get to the point where we we possibly recall Reese Nelson? Because he's he, he grabbed another goal on the weekend. He's got six goals. So I, th- I think Emery must be looking at it thinking, you know, we've got no natural wide players apart from Alex Awobi. When do we actually say, you know, it's time to hit the button? Or do we just, do we just leave him there? What do you reckon? I actually think that if you've committed to sending him out on loan for his own development... You should let him complete that loan phase because you, yeah. you've sent him there for that purpose. And it's like stunting his development if you pull him back, because if you do pull him back, he's not going to play every week. I think we can all agree on that, that Emery will not select him week in, week out. So by doing that, I think you're you're disturbing his development. And I don't think that's the right way to go. I think it's more likely that Unai Emery will dip into the transfer market come January for a player of that ilk as opposed to um, you know, calling back Reese Nelson. But interestingly, Reese Nelson has been playing as, as a centre forward for Hoffenheim. A bit of like a ghost number nine. He's not actually been operating from the flank. And that will have been partly why he's probably scored so many goals. Um, and I know we spoke about him quite a bit last week, but he, he is doing brilliantly well. And, and to answer your question, I just feel like if you pulled him back now, you'd be defeating the object of sending him on loan in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I I agree with you to be honest with you I think it'll be contentious but it kind of does get to that stage where you know we've got a Bamiyang on on the left and he's not really doing much of a job there in terms of what his actual role should be obviously got player of the month last year uh, controversially as you might have heard yeah by a certain radio presenter but um 
I think that we it's just something that we lack in terms of the style that we want to play. We do need players who can run with the ball. And then we also need our overlapping fullbacks to be in great form. And the last few games, they, they really haven't. But in terms of the wingers we do have, uh, Henrik Mkhitaryan was another one. I've been so disappointed with him, Harry. And I heard from a lot of Manchester United fans, actually, that this is what he kind of does. Yep. He seems to sulk a little bit. And I'm seeing that a bit, you know, because he's not starting every game now. And to be fair, he did score yesterday. You know, it was a cross, but I thought we was OK. But in general, he's not the player I thought we were getting. And to be honest, you know, I don't know who's done worse out of that transfer with Alexis, <laughs> to be honest, because he's been like much worse for United, considering the player that, that he was. But yeah, I think Emery might have to go in and look for a proper winger. But it's just, do you reckon he'll be given the money though? I, I don't think so. I don't think he'll be given vast amounts of money, if I'm honest. Um, again, as we discussed last week, I think that the, the self-sustaining uh, model will be even more closely monitored once Stan Kroenke takes full control of the club. So I don't think he'll be given vast amounts of money. However, I, I do think he'll get someone in. Um, I do think he'll get someone in and... The hope is that someone like Sven Mislintat can identify these types of players without spending a fortune. And, and hopefully that will level the playing field for us a little bit um, in terms of competing with the top sides in the league. I, I, it's difficult, isn't it? You, you know, you look around Europe. Can you think of a standout winger that you'd like Emery to bring in? You probably can't. I certainly can't off the top of my head. But then when I think about, uh, I had an interesting conversation with Roman Molina the other day. Unai Emery's biographer, that show is available on our YouTube channel, SoundCloud, iTunes, wherever you want, if you want to check that out. And he emphasized the um, the importance Unai Emery places on his fullbacks in providing him with width. And it seems to me, from what I've seen so far, that Emery likes to play with inverted wingers, stroke midfielders. Um, so I don't think that will be a, a desperate requirement for him at this moment in time. I don't think he'll see that as a priority. I think he'll look to strengthen us in other areas before he dips in for a winger. I don't know what you think. Yeah, I mean, that, that's probably right. And to, to be honest, Harry, if we are looking at, uh, if we're looking to Miss Lintat for players that we can bring in, I have full faith because I was watching the uh, the Classica on Saturday and Dortmund played with a back four where the average age was probably about 20. Yep. Um, yep. And another guy, a winger, uh, Bryn Larson, who was up up front. And the fact that they they were able to pull these gems out, you know, year after year, constantly, and then sell them, like what inevitably happens, sell them onto to Bayern Munich. I've got full faith that Mr. Tap will be able to identify some youngsters for us to go and get, like Matteo Guendouzi, um, of that ilk, who can really step it up. So I, I'm not I'm not too worried. I think that's the kind of aim that Arsenal have. As you said, self-sustaining model. They'll go out and get youngsters and hope to turn them into big players rather than, you know, splashing the cash. Yeah, absolutely. And Mike, one one final question from me. Um, I, I've already said that I feel it's a good time. Do you feel that the international break has come at a good time for Arsenal? Because I feel like we're blowing on empty at the moment. I feel like we're we're running low on batteries and maybe this break has come at the perfect time for us. Your thoughts? Uh, for Arsenal, yes. For me, no, because I hate international <laughs> football. I mean, this whole business with Wayne Rooney getting his 120th cap against USA, I mean, what a, what a nonsense. Like, is is a cap worth nothing these days? Obviously so no, not. <laughs> no, I, I mean, come on. Like, it's just a bit of a token gesture. But yeah, in terms of, of myself, um, it's not come at a good time. But for Arsenal, yes, it has. I think we do look tired. This Thursday, Sunday, Europa League routine is killing them. And maybe that's a criticism of, of Emery, Harry, that we have to say, because he's taken the big players out there. Now, under Wenger, we, we wouldn't have done that. Yep. So you could maybe say that the result of that, of taking the big players out, making them travel to these faraway places, that might be having an effect on us. So I think Emery does need to weigh that up. Maybe when we're actually... 100% through to the knockout stages. He might change his mind and go with a younger side. But we'll see. Yeah, I think we can do with a break. I just hope that, you know, when we come back against Bournemouth, we can we can start we can start well. Because that, that's what we need to do now. You know, he, he, he's seen us through a very good run. But I think now is the time to really step up. Because, you know, it's not going to be an easy 5-5 five, five top four, which is what we're going for. 
Yeah. You know, Spurs are Spurs are playing absolutely rubbish, but but they're winning games. So, you know, just one thing, Harry, I do want to mention that I saw this week. I have to have a dig at Spurs here because uh, I read this week <laughs> that they were in trouble with the advertising staff, staff agency. Did you see this story? Yeah, <laughs> go on. <laughs> because Let of on. their uh, advert, the only place in London to watch the Europa, not, not the Europa League, the Champions League, which has clearly not been true as they're still not in their stadium. That's right. It's false but, advertising. Yeah, false advertising. You know, I, I hope they do get... Well, the, the funny thing is that I heard the complaint was by an Arsenal fan, which doesn't surprise me. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me either. Not right. one bit. Mike, thank you very much for joining me once again. Um, your Twitter handle is on the screen for those who want to follow you. Um, for those who are listening via the audio, Mike, do you want to just tell them what it is? Yeah, it's um, at Mike underscore Stavrou. That's S-T-A-V-R-O-U. That's the one. That's the one. <laughs> Mike, thanks very much. And we'll speak again in the very near future, I'm sure. Cheers, Harry. Take it easy. Right. We've come to the final segment of this week's podcast. And this is the bit where we answer or I answer this week some some of your listener questions. So thank you to those of you who submitted them via Twitter or all the other platforms. Apologies if I don't get around to yours. Um, I am uh, constricted by time. So I do apologize for that. Um, As you can see, if you're watching on the video, I've changed location. Uh, had some unexpected guests turn up, meaning that I've got to come to the man cave to finish off. And as you can see, the man cave is in a bit of a state, um, given I'm trying to decorate a bedroom at the moment. And so I've moved all the junk from in there into here. Um, but that's enough about that. Uh, listener questions. The first one comes in from Fabrice on Twitter. He asks, do you think it's time for Emery to consider dropping either Aubameyang or Lacazette? Um, it's a difficult one for Brees because... They're both producing in terms of scoring goals. So I guess if you look at just purely statistics, then you'd have to say no. But based on the fact that I don't think Aubameyang offers anything else to the team when he plays on the left flank, um, I, I think it's... I, I feel like we're missing something with him out there. I don't know what. I don't think we've got any internal solutions at the moment. Um, I think maybe if Emery was to dip into the transfer market and get a wide forward in then then he'd have a real decision to make but at present I think he's going to keep it the way it is um, on the basis that there's not much in terms of better options available to him Um, also Fabrice asks the formation is crying out for a winger Uh, do you think we will sign one in January do I think we will sign one in January I'm not sure to be honest I I don't think Arsenal are too keen um, on doing any big business during the January window Based on, on the rumblings that are coming out of the club at the moment, I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't sign anybody uh, in January. Obviously, that's not what I want to happen. Of course, I want to see us strengthen. But that is um, my gut feeling at the moment. Uh, so thanks for your questions, Fabrice. This next one comes from Christian Lawfer. He asks, would you recall Nelson from Hoffenheim um, in January if we could get him solid minutes in the PL games? Or would you let him finish the season in the Bundesliga the loss of Welbeck is more significant than we think, in my opinion. Christian, I kind of answered this one earlier on in the show um, when I was talking to Mike, and I, and I did say that I wouldn't bring him back. Um, the reason being that I feel you'd be shortchanging the player. He's gone out there to learn. He's gone out there to develop. We can't guarantee him the game time that he's getting at Hoffenheim. I don't think there's any question about that. So in my view, he should stay there and, and do what he was sent out there to do, and that's improve and, and develop. Um, so yeah, uh, the last question I'm going to go with this evening or this week, I should say, comes from at Sutton Loza on Twitter. His screen name is, is up for grabs now. Fantastic. And a great picture as well of the 89 winning goal. Uh, great stuff. He asks, what are you the thought? What are your thoughts? Sorry, of either getting in Callum Wilson from Bournemouth, recalling Nelson or giving Eddie a chance to replace Welbeck. Seems a lot of people are talking about Nelson coming back. As I've already said, I don't think that's the right way to go. I think Nelson should stay at Hoffenheim and and learn and develop. I'm not going to repeat myself, but in terms of Callum Wilson from Bournemouth, I think he's a very useful forward. He's got a lot of good attributes. He's strong. He's quite quick. Um, He's an accomplished finisher. Um, But I think, without being a snob, Callum Wilson is at a club that suits his level at the moment. And I think the step up to someone like Arsenal would be too much for him. Um, I always wonder with players like that, if they're playing for someone like Bournemouth, uh, they're in the spotlight of the Premier League. Why hasn't somebody gone along and got him? 
So for me, he's at his level at the moment and, and I don't think that he would add much to this Arsenal squad, if I'm honest. Um, in terms of giving Eddie Nketiah a chance, this is something that, that I've been battling to and fro with people um, on the last few days because I don't think that Eddie Nketiah has proved anything at Arsenal. Nothing at all. Nothing whatsoever. So for people to be saying, you know, the, the manager's wrong not to throw him in and that he should lead the line in the Europa League and stuff in, in Welbeck's absence, I think is absolutely ludicrous. I think until we see something from Eddie Nketiah, we can't claim that he's this golden child and this this gem of a striker that's going to bag a, a shitload of goals when he comes in the team. Eddie Nketiah is unproven for me. And on that basis, he, he's not ready to replace anyone, I think. And that brings us to the end of another show. Please, if you're listening on YouTube or watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button and hit share. Um, likes are really appreciated. If you like the video, of course, and all your comments, both uh, positive and negative, are appreciated too. Uh, if you're listening on iTunes, subscribe. If you're listening on SoundCloud, give us a follow and give us a like on there too. Uh, we'll be back next week now uh, due to the international break. So we'll be back next Tuesday with a full-length episode. And then a preview show on the following Thursday to uh, look ahead to the Bournemouth game. So thank you very, very much, guys, for listening once again. And until next time, ciao.